So in the progression of time, we've seen industrial revolutions come and go, but what you do see is that the effects of technology change and the industrial revolutions are lasting, and we need to manage things in a sustainable way if we want to be able to live in harmony with our environment and start contributing uh, to our environment too as we develop. So we come to nanotechnology. Now, nanotechnology is about looking at things at the 10 to the minus 9 scale. It's a billionth of a meter. If you take a human hair, that's about 100 microns. You divide that up by 1,000, that's 100 nanometers. 10,000 is 10 nanometers. Now, that is the scale we are talking about in nanotechnology, and it's about manipulating these things in order to produce some useful technology and systems based on this. So really what we are talking about is manipulating things in the smallest scale. These are the smallest Lego blocks available to mankind to be able to produce useful devices. Now as we make things smaller and smaller, so we take something from 3D and make it into 2D, effectively a sheet of material. We take that sheet of material and slice it up to make it into 1D, right, a wire, or we make it into 0D, a quantum dot. Properties of things change. Effectively, if you think of it from a surface area point of view, you're taking a large surface area with respect to the volume, making it smaller and smaller and smaller until the point that your atom, your molecule, is the total surface. So the surface to volume ratio becomes very high. And once that happens, strange things happen to materials. It becomes far more reactive. And, and these can be illustrated in some of the nanotechnology products out there. If you start putting met iron nanoparticles into fuels, you can reduce the combustion temperature from 2,000 to 450 degrees. A colleague and friend of mine, uh, Rashef Tene from the Weizmann Institute, um, is working on inorganic spheres and metal spheres, and, and they are putting this into petroleum products, and this is helping in the combustion. If you start making surfaces very, very small, you start being able to interact with van der Waal forces. So, for instance, these geckos and certain lizards can walk upside down simply because the surface area that is in contact between the animal and the actual surface is so large that it appears to stick to things. So the Spider-Man suits, etc., become possible simply because you've got these nanoscale, nanostructured surfaces. You can get special magnetic properties, and you can get optical properties also that are unique. And if you look at these unique optical properties, all of these vials of uh, liquid contain gold. But what we've done is change the size of the gold nanoparticle from 2 nanometers to 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. And purely by changing the size, we can change the color because you have surface resonances and plasmonic effects that come in that change the color of things simply because of the absorption you get when things become smaller and smaller. It's about interaction of the electromagnetic wave with your surface that is giving rise to these changes. Now, as nanotechnologists, it's always good to get a feel for what exactly are people trying to do? And if you take the example of, say, me standing here in front of you, we all like to be taller than we are and, and say that I'm two meters, although I'm not quite two meters yet. I hope I'm growing still. But if you take two meters and compare my height to the diameter of the Earth, say 12,000 kilometers, and say I had a buckyball in my hand, which is of the order of a nanometer, and compare that to 10 centimeters, which is the size of my hand, the two ratios you get are approximately the same. So me standing here on this earth and a buckyball in my hand, so what does that mean? Nanotechnologists today 
are trying to manipulate things and make useful devices out of the buckyball on my hand to make devices the size of a few centimeters. So the analogy is, it's like me, you, everyone in this world working in synergy together on a playing field as large as the earth. And this is talking about doing things synergistically. And that's the challenge nanotechnologies have in talking about self-assembly and being able to manufacture things on the nanoscale when you're trying to get properties that are on the macroscopic centimeter scale dimensions. Now in the UK, we were able to persuade the government that nanotechnology is very, very important and they needed to put significant resources behind it. And a report was written by Sir John Taylor. And he summarized the potential impact of nanotechnology very well. It's about making smaller, cheaper, lighter, faster devices with greater functionality using less materials and consuming less energy. So that's what nanotechnology is about. It's about trying to make things that are useful, but using less energy, making materials that have less material in it, less matter in it, so that it's more efficient, and providing useful function. So from a nanotechnology point of view, you can contribute to all of these areas. And what I want to concentrate on is just the energy, and in particular, um, solar energy. So let's look at how nanotechnology can help with the green energy needs. If we start looking at energy, energy can effectively be produced by three means. You have the chemical route to producing things, which is the photosynthesis part or the solar cell part. And it's about generating uh, electrons using redox processes or using oxidative processes. And the energy you gain generally is very, very small per event. It's on the electron volt scale. But you have many millions of these happening and thereby you can build up the photovoltage or the photovoltaic cell. You can go for a not much, much more larger energy giving process such as the nuclear process if you want. And in this case, you're talking about splitting heavy nuclei or fusing small uh, light nuclei like you see in the sun. You get large amounts of energy released, but you have to put in a huge amount of investment and get special materials that can give rise to this sort of process. You also have the mechanical route where you have wind, water, and other various sources in which there is thermomechanical movements associated. And in this case, say for instance, hydroelectricity, water falling a few meters will probably give you milli-electron volts, and that's why you need to have very high dams that have very fast flowing water in order to get useful energy out that can uh, run a turbine. But looking at solar energy, the solar energy conundrum is very simple. At the moment, this energy price is too high. It's about 30 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's without storage. What you need to do is to compete with 3 cents or 6 cents of fossil fuels. We are currently producing about 10 gigawatts of power from solar, when you really need to be thinking about 5 to 10 terawatts of power. You have the biomass process where you can have harvested biomasses that, that allow you to then use fermentation and cellulose and then start getting biofuels, etc. Again, this is quite a good process to produce things. It's renewable because you have a life cycle that goes around, but it's not the most efficient process. And also, you have many uh, emissions associated with the process that is then contributing back into uh, the, the CO2 problem that you would have 